Okay, let's get into some climate change news, starting with climate change-ish news. Um, interesting article out of Politico. Life after COVID, Europeans want to keep their cities car-free. This is excellent. And also in Seattle, um, they blocked off a couple of blocks, city blocks in some places in Seattle. And they said after coronavirus is over, they're going to they're gonna keep those roads closed to vehicular traffic. They're going to keep them only walkable and bikeable roads, which I am totally for. City dwellers across Europe are getting used to clean air. Oh, is that so? With the first wave of the coronavirus pandemic appearing to subside, Europe is giving its love to wide, bike-friendly boulevards and cafe terraces instead of car-clogged streets. Well, this isn't actually new. In Paris, like Paris, they have like no car days when the smog is really bad. Uh, over the last few years, they've actually banned cars on certain days. There's no no traffic whatsoever. Um, can you imagine a U.S. city doing this to fight smog? New polling data from 21 cities across six European countries shows a clear majority in favor of measures geared at preventing a return to pre-pandemic levels of air pollution. Hear, hear. There is strong support for new zero emission zones, banning cars from urban areas and maintaining road space gains for bike lanes and pedestrian paths implemented during the health crisis. According to data provided to Politico, 68% of the 7,545 respondents to a YouGov survey conducted for the NGOs, Transport and Environment and the European Public Health Alliance said they wanted to see air pollution reduction policies, including restrictions on car access to city centers, kept in place. Huzzah! The survey covers major cities in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And the Brussels metropolitan area was conducted conducted between May 14th and tw uh, May 21. While 55% of Germans agreed that effective measures to protect citizens from air pollution should be introduced, even if it me means preventing polluting cars from entering the city. In other countries where lockdown measures were more extreme, between 74% and 82% of the population supported such policies. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot of percent. Lockdowns kept people at home and roads empty, leading to a drop in air pollution throughout Europe. However, pollution numbers are rapidly returning to normal as restrictions are lifted. Simple cause and effect there. In order to cater to new mobility habit habits aimed at ensuring social distancing, policies were put in place that range from pop-up bike lanes in Berlin to new speed limit restrictions in the center of Brussels and reduced parking slots in places such as Dublin and Vilnius. Vilnius. The measures have given... Well, here we go. No, no, no. See Italian, Spanish, UK, French, Brussels. Um, most people strongly agreeing that they want to take action to curb air pollution. So, hey, we can. We can use this coronavirus situation to bring awareness and keep these changes going to fight what? climate change or environmental pollution or environmental destruction, why not? It makes perfect sense. In fact, it's logical. In fact, it's common sense. Uh, you know it's not common sense? Destroying the environment for your economy, to keep your economy going. That's what's not common sense. The measures have given urban dwellers a look at the kind of city that environmentalists and green city planners have been demanding for years. <laughs> Look, oh, hey, hey, look, oh, we did it. The survey shows people like the new look. Of course they do. Because it wasn't people that didn't want this in the beginning or over the years. It wasn't that people were against this from the beginning. It was that they weren't actually offered 
the you know the ability to experience this, right? Because the people that make policy, the the politicians, the governments are all in the pockets of the fossil fuel companies, the car manufacturer corporations, you know, all the corporations that want to keep business as usual going. By God, we cannot limit business in any way, shape, or form um, in response to climate change because, well, um, that's bad for business. So we, we weren't allowed to implement these measures that people have been asking for for a long time. And people would have enjoyed, enjoyed and said, hey, this is great. This clean air that I'm breathing. <laughs> My gosh. Um, see, again, there is nothing wrong and it actually is totally right. Totally right to use the coronavirus pandemic as an example of what can be done on an organized level, both on a government level and on an individual level, that we can organize ourselves in a way to effectively bring down emissions and effectively do some, take some major drastic steps to combat climate change. We can do it. The problem is that, oh, it's going to hurt the economy. Well, no shit. You're going to have to change the economy. You're going to have to let go of all that hurting the economy talk. Yeah, the economy is going to have to, you know, take a hit. So sorry. You're just going to have to acknowledge that and, you know, be a grown-up, be an adult and understand that, you know, the world cannot work the way that it used to work. The world has to work in a new way. And being an adult means having the brains enough and the common sense enough to see that and do something, you know, that makes sense in the face of that. Anyways, another article from The Guardian, Australia's vast carbon sink releasing millions of tons of CO2 back into the atmosphere. Uh, this is not good news. Australia's mangroves and seagrass meadows absorb 20 million tons of CO2 a year, but report warns damage to ecosystems contributing to climate change. Australia's mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows are absorbing about 20 million tons of carbon dioxide every year, according to a major new study that is the first to measure in detail the climate benefits of the coastal ecosystems. But the study published in the Nature uh, journal, Nature Communications, warns that de degradation of these vegetated coastal ecosystems was already seeing 3 million tons of CO2 per year being released back into the atmosphere. <clears throat> the study reveals Australia's vast coastlines represent between 5% and 11% of the so-called blue carbon locked up in mangroves, seagrasses, and tidal marshes globally. Some 44 scientists from 33 different research institutions collaborated on the study, which began in 2014. Dr. Oscar Serrano at Edith Cohen University Center for Marine Ecosystems Research said it found the coastal ecosystem stored between 4,000 uh, million tons excuse me, and 6,300 million tons of CO2. Australia's annual emissions hit a record high in 2018 of 558 0.4 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Hoo-wee. That's a lot, of, a lot of carbon dioxide. Serrano said when the ecosystems are damaged by storms, heat waves, dredging, or other human development, the carbon dioxide stored in their biomass and soils beneath them can make its way back into the environment, contributing to climate change. Globally vegetated coastal ecosystems are being lost twice as fast as tropical rainforests, despite covering a fraction of the area. Coastal ecosystems store carbon in their soils, as well as in the plants themselves, and once absorbed, the carbon can be locked away for thousands of years. If undisturbed, they are able to absorb at up to 40 times faster than forests. There you go. Plant mangroves. They also protect the coasts from erosion, are important nurseries for fisheries, and they clear up the water, so it's very important for several reasons that we preserve these ecosystems, Serrano said. He said the ecosystems were being impacted by coastal developments, dredging, and by climate change. 
The annual losses of carbon from the coastal ecosystems was the equivalent of a 12% to 21% increase in Australia's land use emissions from activities such as land clearing. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to read from this article. In 2015, mangroves on the Gulf of Carpentaria, uh, Carpentaria suffered an unprecedented mass dieback along with a 1,000 kilometer stretch of coastline that coincided with a major heat wave. Yes, and alluding to um, my title, people are wondering what the ozone was. I was literally talking about ozone. <laughs> uh this is from the Daily and Sunday Express out of the UK. Climate change horror. How global warming helped a mass extinction event on Earth. So this is very, very interesting. For those of you who are concerned about uh, the ozone layer and UV levels around the world, um, and I am quite concerned as well, this is actually very frightening um, information. Prehistoric climate change has eroded the ozone layer and fueled a global extinction event, scientists have proposed, as they sound the alarm bells for the present-day effects of global warming. This is from today, June 12, 2020. Uh, climate change has caused considerable, considerable damage to the planet in the past, likely triggering a mass extinction some 359 million years ago. A study published in Science Advances has found the extinction event unfolded between the De uh, Devonian and Carboniferous <clears throat> periods and may have been facilitated by global warming. The study's authors believe the findings could have dire consequences for the current state of the climate. According to John Marshall, lead author and professor of earth science at the University of Southampton, the event wiped out dominant species of vertebrate life in the seas as well as the first four-legged tetrapods, fish whose fins evolved into primitive leg legs. In the article for the conversation, Professor Marshall wrote, the discovery of this potential new extinction mechanisms indicates that a warming climate, now this is the important part, such as we have now, has the potential to erode the ozone layer to let in damaging ultraviolet radiation. What? So, and people have been noticing that, you know, UV levels are, are quite high. And, but we're not really, we haven't really gotten a full-on confirmation that we're having problems with the ozone layer. I, I've, I've only seen very little um, talked about it here and there, bits and pieces, but not overall not the overall idea that, that, that climate change and the warming earth is causing the degradation of the ozone layer, which of course is letting in more UV light, which in course, of course, you know, impacts all manners of living beings on the planet. Um, this has consequences for all life on earth, both on the land and in shallow waters. In their study, the researchers examined the climate mechanisms that eroded the ozone. Um, the researchers found hotter summer temperatures across entire continents contributed to more water vapor being transported into the atmosphere. With the water vapor, organic compounds produced by plants and fungi were carried to the ozone layer. Once in the atmosphere, the compounds were free to release chlorine, which can break down ozone molecules, a compound of three oxygen atoms. And through uh, those scientists have announced in April this year, a record-sized ozone hole in the Arctic has patched up. Professor Marshall believes global warming could still negatively impact years of progress. He said, we believe it is important as important as recognizing that asteroid impacts cause, caused mass extinctions. Once we know about the consequences of asteroid impacts, there followed an intense collective research effort to assess the threat. We now plot the paths of all large extraterrestrial objects likely to come close to the Earth's orbit. Similar, similarly, we now need to focus effort on understanding the links between global warming and the production and, 
an atmospheric transport of chlorine-bearing compa carbon compounds that have the, the potential to cause similar destruction of our ozone layer. Good God. Um, this is huge and probably something that I, I'm, I'm going to guess that some powers that be out there already understand that this is going on, this process is going on. Um, and they're, you know, they're hoping that news about this doesn't get out like, oh, you know, we've already unleashed these mechanisms of climate change and um, these tipping points and these feedback loops and this, you know, another feedback loop, you know, another, another domino in the row of problems um, is, you know, the ozone layer starts to get shredded. Because of climate change, um, according to the worldwide why, worldwide fund for nature, there is no longer an excuse not to act on climate change. Climate scientists have warned global warming needs to be held below 1.5 C of pre-industrial levels to avoid climate breakdown. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, I, I I personally found this to be frightening. <laughs> on many, many levels and panic inducing. Um, but also makes perfect sense. You know, if you wonder why UV levels are up, if you wonder why the sun feels hotter, <laughs> you know, um, here is the evidence that what you're feeling and what you're experiencing and what you're seeing and what people are measuring is not an aberration or not you know, uh, paranoia, <laughs> um, that is actually part of the process. Uh, yes, Anthony Davis need UV protection indeed. Yeah, this is, I mean, just, uh, just another reason to be have it, have your pants scared off you. Uh, lastly, um, on the techno fix front exclusive Tesla secret batteries aim to rework the math for electric cars on the grid. So apparently, um, they've been working on these super secret batteries that are supposed to be really super good and, you know, change the game for electric cars and electric power and, I don't know, guys, you know. Uh, it means that, of course, people are going to be like, yay, technology. Uh, and what are the actual, you know, what are the long-term results of all this going to be? We don't know. We don't know until we get there. We don't know until 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, if we're all still here, you know, what the ecological ramifications are going to be of all these batteries, these super awesome secret batteries. Um, new low cost batteries designed to last for a million miles of use and enable electric electric Teslas to sell profitably for the same price or less than gasoline vehicles are just part of Musk's agenda. People familiar with the plans told Reuters, um, with a global fleet of more than a million electric vehicles that are capable of connecting to and sharing power with the grid, Tesla's goal is to achieve the status of a power company, competing with such traditional energy providers as, as Pacific Gas and Electric and Tokyo Electric Power, those sources said. The new million-mile battery at the center of Tesla's strategy was jointly developed with China's contemporary Amperix Technology Limited and deploys technology developed by Tesla in collaboration with a team of academic Battery experts recruited by Musk, three people familiar with the effort, said. Eventually, improved versions of the battery with greater energy den density and storage capacity and even lower cost will be introduced in addition. Additional Tesla vehicles in, a, in other markets, including North America, the sources said. Tesla's plan to launch the new battery first in China and its broader strategy to reposition the company have not previously been reported. Tesla declined. To comment. So it's very interesting. Why are they releasing this battery in China? Um, I have questions around that. Of course, 
uh, they want to test it in a place that doesn't have, you know, the regulations uh, or the the ability for people to question, you know, what's going on or how this is working or how this is going, right? If you do this in the U.S., then you have a a, a lot more eyeballs and and people you know, curious as to what's going on with these. You do it in China and you can kind of like keep the veil down on what you're doing. Tesla's new batteries will rely on innovations such as low cobalt and cobalt free battery chemistries. You know, sounds good on the surface. And the use of chemical additives. So we don't know what that is materials and coatings that will reduce internal stress and enable batteries to store more energy for longer periods. Sources said, what are these chemical additives? Does anybody know? <laughs> Where do they come from? How dangerous are they? Where, you know, how do you get them? Etc. Tesla also plans to implement new high-speed, heavily automated battery manufacturing processes. So um, are, is this, are these processes run on fossil fuel or are they on, run on green energy? I wonder. Designed to reduce labor costs and increase production in massive Terra factories. Good God, about 30 times the size of the company's sprawling Nevada Gigafactory. That's got to be good for the environment, right? A strategy telegraphed in late April to, to analysts by Musk. Tesla is working on recycling and recovery of such expensive metals as nickel, cobalt, and lithium through its Redwood Materials affiliate as well as new second life applications of electric ba vehicle batteries and grid storage systems such as the one Tesla built in South Australia in 2017. The automaker also said it wants to supply electricity to consumers and businesses, but has not provided details. Don't worry about the details, guys. Re Reuters reported exclusively in February that Tesla was in advanced talks to use CATL's lithium iron phosphate batteries, which use no cobalt, but use lithium, iron, and phosphate, the most expensive expensive metal in EV batteries. Um, CATL also has developed a similar, simpler and less expensive way to packaging battery cells called cell to pack that eliminates the middle step of bundling cells. <clears throat> Excuse me, Tesla is expected to use the technology to help reduce battery weight and cost. Um, so, anyways, let's see. Uh, CATL TL also plans to supply Tesla in China next year with an improved long life nickel magnesium mag, manganese, excuse me, cobalt battery whose cathode is 50% nickel and only 20% cobalt. Tesla now jointly produces nickel, nickel cobalt aluminum batteries with Panasonic at a gigafactory in Nevada and buys NMC batteries from LG Chem in China. Panasonic declined to comment. No comment, no comment, no comment. All right. Well, they're trying to they're trying to um, you know juice us up, guys. We're you know we're 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 going full electric revolution with these batteries. I guess you know I don't know what this means as far as the environmental impact. I'm you know we know on on a basic level what it means. But we don't know what you know what this new wave of batteries is going to mean. Um, we probably won't know until they gave us more details, which you know obviously they're declining to do that. Rich Diana says China is coming out with an affordable e car. Well, yep, maybe that's why they're doing it. I just, I just, I just, I just don't know. This sounds like a whole lot of. You know, a whole lot more industry, right? We're going to build these Terra factories. We're going to have all these batteries all over the place, you know. And what the, you know, what the eventual degradation of these batteries means to the environment and to people, right? What happens when these batteries leak or get broken or become older or start to age out? How do you get rid of these batteries? How do you recycle all the stuff that's in them? Where do they go? What do they? What happens when people just throw them in a trash heap 
in some other country that doesn't have the regulations that maybe the U.S. or other countries have. Yes, Gene, I agree with you. Kevin, it isn't going to work. We need to end capitalism with a big C. Hey, guys, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. You can also support the channel at the links below. PayPal, Square, and Patreon. Also, um, all of my live streams are available for listening on Patreon if you happen to miss them during the day. So um, you can sign up for my Patreon for as little as a dollar. If you want to go check out the live streams, they are all there. Thanks a lot.